you're excited to know Jesus Christ and to be together with a group of people that have been saved by him and worship him together today. Come on. That deserves more than a woo. That deserves some of our excitement way down deep. If you're watching online, so glad you're here today. Uh, what you just saw, you're going to hear us talking about throughout the month of September, and that's bridge groups. We're kicking off bridge group promotion this month, starting right now today. If you're on site today, you walked through the lobby and saw that uh, table set up and all those things about bridge groups. I want you to take a second, if you're not in bridge groups, or maybe you haven't ever been in one, or maybe you just haven't signed up yet, and I want you at the end of service today to walk by that table and check out what bridge groups are happening right here at the Bridge Goldsboro. Bridge groups are so much more than just things that happen, uh, another sort of event to go to, their family. You're going to be finding out more about that. Uh, but I want to take a second and talk about the Connect card that you have in the seat back in front of you. If you're watching online, there's a digital Connect card, and that's really for everybody in the room. Uh, it's especially for those of you who are here for the very first time today, and I just want to say thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name's Ryan. I'm the pastor here at the Bridge Goldsboro, and I want you to take a second and let us know you're here. Uh, in fact, uh, at the end of the service today, we have a guest gathering, right? Right outside in the lobby, if you're on site today, we have some just a, a, uh, some snacks for you, some really good homemade stuff. But really, it's just about a minute or two just to put a face with the name, just so you can meet me and some of our staff. Uh, we value you and we're grateful you're here. And that's not only for you if you're here for the first time, but really, if you've been here for maybe for a month or so, uh, we say new ish, and you're kind of maybe you haven't had an opportunity to meet some of the staff. Guest gathering is an opportunity for you to do that. And that's happening today, right after the service is over in the lobby. Um, this coming up weekend, this Saturday, uh, is Freedom Fest. We're going to be honoring the military, honoring our first responders. And one of the ways that we're going to be doing that is volunteering at Freedom Fest, passing out bottles of water, talking about Jesus, giving people some invites to the church. Uh, but more so than that, we're going to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. And so if you want to help volunteer for that, uh, online events, or excuse me, bridgechurch.cc forward slash events, you can register for that. That's happening this Saturday. We want you to be a part of it. Uh, also, September 15th, we're having an ownership class. If you've been coming to the bridge any length of time and you say, hey, what's what's left for me to do besides attend church services? You're gonna find out what it means, not just to be a part of a church service, but to be a part of the core that moves this church forward in the kingdom of God. And so you can register for that. There is a free lunch involved, but we need to know that you're coming. So please register for that on the events page. Uh, also, September 20th and 21st is our one marriage conference. I asked some people uh, today, I said, is your marriage perfect? And of course, nobody raised their hand. I said, great, that makes you a candidate uh, for this marriage conference. We have invested a lot into this. It's gonna be a great weekend. It also includes a really nice dinner on Friday night. Uh, so register for that online on, on our events page. Um, also, uh, this past week, we had the opportunity, like we do several times a year, to feed the homeless. And uh, I want you to be a part of that if you haven't already been a part of it. At the Bridge Goldsboro, we, we really value not just being in here in this room, not just watching something on a screen, but getting out into the community and helping those who are less fortunate. So we had the opportunity to feed the homeless. Uh, we had one of our bridge groups actually uh, be a part of this. They had a, a, a wonderful time doing it, but they had one of the biggest turnouts they've ever had, uh, feeding the people that are in our community that maybe aren't necessarily interested in getting off the streets just yet, but they just need a meal. And so we're interested not only uh, in helping them in restoration, which we do in other ministries, but sometimes they just need to see a smiling face and someone that Jesus say, saying that Jesus loves them. Did you know that if, if it wasn't for people that give at this church, none of this that we talked about would be possible? And so I just want to take just, just a small portion of time and just say thank you so much for your generosity and all that you give to the Bridge Goldsboro. Every single dollar that comes in here goes towards life and giving life in Jesus Christ, not only to the people in our church building and the people in our church family, but the people in our community as well. And so if you haven't been a part of that, if you haven't given, if you are kind of waiting to see, I just want to tell you, when you give to the Bridge Goldsboro, you're giving into fertile ground. There's so many different ways that you can give. I just encourage you to be a part of one of those ways and give into what God is doing and be a part of this. Are you ready to worship the Lord this morning? Are you ready to worship God through singing? Come on, let's stand up together and worship him with our hearts. Well, good morning, Bridge Goldsboro. Well, this morning we're going to sing some songs that you may have known some years ago. 
We're going to kind of throw it back this morning a little bit. So listen, if you know him, I want you to sing your heart out to the Lord. Come on, let's get this song up together. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. And everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of the Savior. The hope of nations. Yeah. I think y'all remember this. It says this. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered. Jesus conquered the grave. Hey. Yeah. Come on, let's sing this verse. So take me as you find me. Come on. So take me as you find me. All my fears and failures. Feel my is my prayer. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. I surrender. Oh, my Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave shine your light and let the whole world see for the glory of the risen King Jesus shine your light and the whole world see yeah. for the glory of the risen King. Come on, sing it out. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We sing it for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. Come on, sing it out, y'all. Come on. My God is mighty to sing. Y'all remember that? He is mighty to sing. How long? Forever, after of salvation. Come on, what did he do for me and you? He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. You must say that he can move the mountain. My God is mighty to sing. For the glory of the risen
together come on
serve an undefeated God. I want to let you know if you're walking through something that's maybe just beyond you or you just can't feel how this is going to or how it's going to turn out, I want you to know that he never lost a battle. He's undefeated. And I love what this part says, you have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all. Come on, can we sing that? You have no equal. Come on. You have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all. Sing that chorus, come on. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is the name of Jesus Christ our King. What a powerful name it is, and nothing compares to this. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name one more time with the voice. What a powerful, what a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus.
Oh, you're so great. You're so awesome, Lord. And we just come with hearts of just gratitude and with humility. Just knowing how great you are and how beautiful you are to us. There is no one like you. You have no rival, Lord. You have no equal. You're undefeated. There's no one like you, Lord. We recognize this this morning. How you came and you saved us. And how you love us in spite of what we do. And yet you still show us grace and mercy. And your love and kindness never fails. It never ends. And it's not that anything that we have done is because of your great love. So, Lord, this morning we honor you, we give you praise, and we give you glory and the honor that you deserve. You are so worthy. So we just pray that today that you speak a word to our heart. May we receive this word that you have for us. May your name be honored and may it be glorified. In Jesus' name. Come on, can the church give a big amen? Amen. My name is Andy Forrester, and I am inviting all men to join me on an important expedition. As Christian men, we are called to be warriors in the kingdom, to fight for and defend what we believe, and also to love well and live free. However, there is an enemy and a whole host of his friends that are fighting against us. The Bible says that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. It is said that we live in the most beautiful love story set in the midst of the fiercest battle. It is crucial for us to know who the enemy is, where he is, and what he is up to in our lives. We must be equipped and oriented on how to defend ourselves and our families, especially our children. But in order for us to become the warriors we are called to be, we must know that we are his beloved sons. In this small group series, we'll be reading The Heart of a Warrior by Michael Thompson, along with a 12 session video series to discover who we are, where we are, and the good that God is up to in our lives. And more importantly, what is in the way of us becoming the image bearers God created us to be. So if you wanna take back some ground that the enemy has stolen, saddle up with me and a few other men and join me on this expedition so that we can live with nothing to hide nothing to prove, and nothing to fear. I hope to see you there, Thursday nights at 6.30, right here at TBG. There's a lot happening this month at the Bridge Goldsboro. Here's what I want to tell you. Don't miss out on what's happening in your church family. It's so easy just to make church a Sunday thing. And if I can just tell you, church is so much more than just a Sunday thing. Uh, it is an every day of the week thing. Uh, and you have a place in it. And there is a bridge group that's waiting for you this month. That's just one of them. Uh, that's uh, our, my good friend, Andy Forrester. He's actually one of the elders here at this church. He's leading a group this semester, uh, a men's group. And so if you're a, a man and you're like, hey, this, I want to be around other guys that love Jesus. I want to be in a group where I can do some man things um, and maybe get away from everybody at the house for a little while. This, that, that's the group for you. We have groups with mixed ages. We have groups for, uh, for people that are, are married in terms of just you can come with your spouse. We have uh, groups that are specifically for young adults. I want you to, f to, to look at all these groups online, figure out which one you need to be in. And I want you to be in a group this semester coming up in the fall. Um, there's so much happening in the life of the church. Go to bridgechurch.cc forward slash events and find out all the things that are happening for, for you to be a part of. Next week, we're going to be starting a new series called Target on Your Back. And it's a series largely about David. If you don't know about David, the 90,000 foot view is he was, he was uh, chased, he was chastised, he was talked about. Uh, he was, there was an uh, attempt of murder on his life. And we look at, if anybody had a target on their back in the Bible, there was lots of them. David always kind of comes to mind. And what we're going to be talking about in this series talk, starting next week is, what do we do biblically when we have a target on our back? 
What do you do when the person at work has it out for you? What do you do when there's tension in the family and there's just, there's somebody that's just always seems to be looking at, at your faults and always seems to be kind of after you? What do we do biblically? You know, there's lots of different places you could go in the world with your friend groups and find out what they would tell you to do. What does God want you to do? That's what we're going to be talking about in that series. And I think today is a good intro to that series because today I, I want to go a little deeper into what we started last week. And you might say, well, we talked about something last week. Why are we going to talk about it again? Last week we ended the Jonah series and we ended on forgiveness. Uh, it tied into what Jonah was talking about. But really when we ended the, ended the series, we talked about how are we supposed to forgive others who have wronged us? And it's interesting. It, it hit our congregation in a way that I didn't expect. In fact, it was actually a good way. I had so many people come up to me after the service and talk about how the message touched them in their particular context and, and their story about forgiveness. Uh, but it didn't stop there. There were texts and there were emails over the next couple of days uh, about how it applied to them and, and needing some extra advice on how to, to move forward. And there's always some follow-up like that. But last week, it was just different. It hit different. And as I began to think about what I should talk about this week, today is a sort of a one-off message. It's not really tied to a series. Uh, we kind of put those throughout the year so we can kind of hear what God's saying, if he's saying something different than what we planned. Uh, because we plan our series literally a year in advance. Uh, did you know that God is a planner? Well, how is the Holy Spirit going to move? Well, let me tell you something. The Bible says he had your salvation in place long before the existence of the world was created. God can certainly work in our planning. But as I began to think and pray, God, what do you want me to say this week? I just kept hearing him over and over again say, I'm not done working in people's hearts. I'm not done working in the stories. And to be honest with you, we could probably do a whole series on forgiveness. Last week, I sort of hit the, the 90,000 foot view of it. And God just began to tell me, I want you to go deeper this week. There are some people walking through some things in life that are so difficult that it's hard for them to grasp this thing of forgiveness. And, and maybe you need to take some of the things we're going to talk about today for yourself. And maybe you need to really take an inventory to help somebody else. Forgiveness can actually be one of the most difficult things that you'll ever do. In fact, for some of you, it's the most difficult thing you're walking through to date, having to forgive. Uh, interestingly, for some, depending on the offense, it can be something that's very simple. But regardless how we feel about it, I think it's important to understand how God feels about forgiveness because everything we do should be aimed after what he says and how he feels. This is what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 15. He said, your heavenly father will forgive you if you forgive those who sin against you. But if you refuse to forgive them, he will not forgive you. And sometimes we look at that and we go, well, what hope is there for any of us? Pastor, you don't know what I've walked through. You don't know what someone did to me. You don't know what they took from me. And, and look, I've, I've got stories. You've got stories. We could probably hear stories that would make us cry. And we could talk for days about what we're walking through and about how we've had to journey through this thing called life and things that weren't fair, things that, that people have put on us, people that have taken things from us. But yet this scripture that the son of God spoke with his own words, that your heavenly father will forgive you if you forgive those who have sinned against you. But if you refuse to forgive them, he won't forgive you. Did you know that the will of God, his plan, his, we always say, what does God want me to do? What is, I want to be in God's will. Did you know that his will ultimately is for everyone to come underneath his forgiveness? Nod your head if you're with me. Give me a thumbs up online in the chat. It, his will is for everybody to come up under his forgiveness. Everything you do in this life that's good, everything you do that's joyful, everything that you do that's life-giving will be in and through Jesus Christ because of what he's done for you. If you agree with that, say amen. We don't have any other life besides life in Jesus Christ, not real life. And so everything that we have in life that's good is because he forgave us and we're walking in his forgiveness. But he says, if you won't forgive, then he can't forgive you. So that stands to reason that unforgiveness takes you out of the will of God. His will is for you to be forgiven. 
But if we don't forgive, we can't be. His will is for you to walk in this life that he's given you through forgiveness. But if we don't forgive others, we can't walk in that. So unforgiveness actually takes you out of the will of God. Notice how I didn't say it takes them out of the will of God. It doesn't affect them at all. Unforgiveness in your heart takes you out of the will of God. You cannot be in right standing with God and have unforgiveness in your heart against someone else. God went to great, great lengths to save us, to, to forgive all of our sins against him. But we can never be further away from him than when we, when we harbor unforgiveness in our hearts. It's the opposite of who God says he is in Exodus 43, 6, when he says he's the God of compassion and mercy. He says, I'm slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. When we're harboring unforgiveness in our heart, we're the opposite of a God who said in Romans 5.20, as people sinned more and more, his wonderful grace became more abundance. In other words, as you sinned, as your sins were stacked high, his grace was higher than that. When we have unforgiveness in our hearts, it pulls us against God. I'll say it like this, where unforgiveness lives our relationship with God begins to die. Turn to somebody and say, he started this way too deep. It's gonna get lighter. But I think we need to start with what God thinks. We need to start with a foundation of what God's word says. We're called to forgive. It reminds me of the couple who had been married for 15 years and they were having some disagreements more than normal and it started to really put a wedge between them and and so what they decided to do was they were going to make two fault boxes and she was going to have one and he was going to have one and daily she'd write down the faults and he would write down the faults of her and they'd put it in the perspective box of all the things they saw that they didn't like and they were arguing about and so at the end of the week you know they they look gave each other their boxes and they started to look at the grievances that the other one had against the other one and the man opened his first and he pulls the first one out and it says, you know, you left the jelly off the, off the jar and you licked the spoon, right? You left your dirty socks on the floor. You know, you, you, you left the bed undone. You left dirty towels on the floor in the bathroom and over and over again, just little things that she thought, you know, I'm gonna make sure he knows this so make sure we can fix it. And then she began to open hers and she opened up the first one and it just said, I love you. Open up the second one. I love you. All throughout the week, he had been taking the things that he had grievances against her about and forgiving and simply saying, I love you on that. Now, I know that's forgiving. It's not always a matter of someone's dirty socks on the floor. Sometimes it's deeper than that, isn't it? Forgiving somebody sometimes isn't as easy as simply swallowing your pride and just doing it. For some, the hurt is so bad that you don't even know where to start when it comes to forgiving. You want to forgive, but this deep thing way down inside of you, this hurt, you can't reconcile how to forgive and this hurt to go away. And sometimes we think because the hurt's still there, then I must not have forgiven. Sometimes it's a situation that doesn't just hurt, but in fact, the hurt changes who we are. And we begin to walk forward kind of a different person because of the hurt that was done to us. And I, I want you to understand this, that through the power of forgiveness, God can take something that changed you and turn it into something that empowers you to change other people for good. Like God can take a hurt that literally changed the direction, the change the course of your life and through forgiveness, empower you in such a way that you can begin to change other people who are walking through the same thing. Something you thought that would be the end of you ends up being the thing that God uses in you that blesses other people through you. And if you're sitting in pain right now so bad that you can't hardly stand it, because even as I've talked, just a little bit that I've talked, you, some of you have that person, that hurt, that thing in your mind right now, and you're just like, I don't even know where to start with that. Let me tell you, there is life on the other side of this thing through forgiveness, and God can show you just how to do it. It's not an easy thing to do. And a lot of times it will hurt more than you've ever hurt before. And you don't even know where to start. Can I, can I just tell you that God doesn't just expect you to just sort of whitewash over that and move on. He doesn't just expect you just to forgive and keep going. He also, listen, he also understands where you're at. 
he identifies with you. We don't serve a God who's on a throne a million miles away making commands. You should do this because I said it. We serve a God that when he says this to us to forgive, that he understood what it was like to, to have people to, to, to cast stones at him, to judge him, to mock him. And he understands where we're coming from. I'd much rather go to somebody who understands where I'm at than somebody who doesn't have a clue. Have you ever, and this isn't a judgment, but have you ever gone to somebody for help? Maybe a Christian or a pastor, and you've got deep-seated hurt in you, and they just want to give you Bible verses? Now, we all know the Word of God has the power to change, and the Word of God inside of it. But sometimes we don't need a Bible verse. Sometimes we need someone to understand where we are. And there are certain people that just can't understand where you are because they've never been through what you're going through. They don't know the intricacies of it. They don't know the day in and day out and the little small things that remind you of this and, and it plagues your brain and where everybody else seems fine and you're dying on the inside. Sometimes people just don't get it. And, and when we're going to people for that, we're, we want someone to identify and know where we are. And when they say something and we're like, oh, he gets it. Oh, she understands. Oh, we just take a deep breath and we're like, finally, someone that gets it. That's Jesus. In fact, the writer of Hebrews 4.15 says, we don't have a high priest talking about Jesus who's unable to empathize with whose weaknesses? With ours. But we have one who has been tempted in every way. That means we haven't been through anything that he doesn't understand. Just as we are, yet he didn't sin. In other words, he did it the right way and got through it. This, word, this verse, it wouldn't even exist if Jesus didn't want us to know that he gets where we are and empathizes over our hurts. That he knows our hurts are bad. And since they're on your mind, they're on his heart. So you gotta know, you, you serve a God who is saying you have to forgive. But when you're angry and you're hurt, you can know he gets it. That Jesus knows how you feel. And he's ready to walk with you through it. I, I look at Jesus' worst day, the day he was hurt most by others. I think it's important that we visit this for just for a moment. It was that day that he was on the cross. It was the Thursday night before, and he was eating with his disciples. He would have what we would call the Last Supper. And then later that night, he would have more anxiety than anybody on the planet as the Bible says, he had so much anxiety and so much pressure about what he was getting ready to walk through that, that blood capillaries literally began to burst in his forehead, which we found out way later that scientifically and medically that can happen under extreme duress. And blood began to mix with sweat and drop down his face. And he, he prayed, Father, if there's any other way to do this, let it be a different way, but nevertheless, your will be done. And then he was betrayed by one of his own disciples, Judas. In fact, one that he had walked with for three years came up and kissed him on the cheek as a way of letting the people that had come to arrest him, the mob in the middle of the night, letting them know that, yes, he is in fact the one with a kiss. You ever been stabbed in the back? Not with a knife, but with a sign of affection. That was Jesus. Then he went through illegal trials all night long where he was mocked. He was eventually beaten. He was tortured by the Romans and then eventually got to the point where they ran spikes into him and hung him from a wooden cross. He was hoisted up, not, not with a loincloth around him. That's just so you can watch the movies and bring your kids. History will tell us they were hung up naked, completely exposed. He was not only tortured, he was humiliated. And get this, he didn't deserve any of it. He was completely innocent. When Jesus hurt the most, the first thing that came out of his mouth was Luke 23, 34. And Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. Can you believe that? Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. It's, it's amazing that he said that, not just given what he was going through, but it's amazing that that's the first thing that came out of his mouth. Emphasizing the priority of forgiveness in our lives. It's not something that you do way later on. It's, it's first. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I, I want to spend the next few minutes that we have left. I want to talk about what forgiveness means in your life practically, but I also want to talk about what it doesn't mean because I think that's important too because sometimes we can get really hung up based on what forgiveness is not and we think that's what it is and so we think, well, we just simply can't forgive. But I, the, the first thing about forgiveness I want you to understand is this. Forgiveness is giving up the right to ensure the other person pays. 
I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. Giving up the right to ensure that the other person pays. I remember a long time ago when I was real young, my older brother and me, we were real little. Uh, my older brother couldn't have been three or four years old, so I was younger than him. And I had taken a toy or something from him, and it got him so frustrated and so mad that he went to go tell on me. Can you believe that? Uh, and he not only told on me, but he was so angry and so frustrated. And my mom got on to me and she said, give him the toy back. And I just wasn't enough for my little brother. And through his little four-year-old voice, he said, I want him spunk. <laughs> I want him spunk. Maybe, uh, did anybody get spunk as a kid? As a kid? <laughs> I hear sometimes people say, I never got spanked as a child. I'm like, what house did you grow up in? You must have been an angel. I got spanked almost every single day. And guess what? I deserved every single one of them. But our unforgiveness is like that, isn't it? I demand that they get it. They have to be. I, I, they have to pay for hurting us. But just like Jesus, forgiveness gives that right up. And sometimes we get lost in that because we think, well, it's not about the fact that I, I want them to hurt. I, it's about the principle of the dang thing. And sometimes we get mixed up in the principle and we just, we, we say, well, they can't just get off scot-free, not for what they did. They have, to, they have to pay for what they did. This is just life. Principle says, I just can't go on and act like that didn't happen. I need an apology in order for this to work. For me to move on and look at them different, they have to do something. I, I need them to feel the weight of what they did. Can I be honest? Heartfelt apologies are nice. And they help, but you might not ever get one. You know, some of you know that. Some of you have, are walking through life and you just, you may not ever get that apology. Does that mean forgiveness isn't reachable for you? Does, does literally somebody else changing and the fact that they don't, is that what God is saying is supposed to keep you out of his will for your life with forgiveness? Waiting for somebody else to do something in order for you to truly forgive in your heart is like saying, I don't have the capacity to make it right with God in my own. I have to get somebody else to help first. And the fact of the matter is, when God said forgive, it wasn't for them, it was for you, primarily. Forgiveness is for you. Sometimes our principle gets in the way of God's perspective. And God's perspective is forgiveness is for you. And sometimes we have to come off of the principle in order to see God's perspective. You know that Jesus never waited for an apology. Jesus never waited for a change of heart. Jesus never waited for us to do the right thing. What did he say? Forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. So forgiveness is giving up the right to ensure that the other person pays. Let me tell you what forgiveness is not. This might help you, help you. Forgiveness is not excusing. Forgiveness is not condoning what they did. Well, I can't forgive them because then they'll think that what they did was okay. Listen, Jesus never excused what they did. Forgiveness isn't accepting what somebody did. Forgiveness is simply taking your hand off of their throat. It's, it's taking your hand off their throat. You'll never agree with what they did. And can I just tell you, God doesn't expect you to agree with what they did. But just like Jesus no longer holds our sin against us, forgiveness means that we don't hold it against them either. Forgiveness is saying I'm not excusing their actions, but as far as I'm concerned, I'm canceling their need to pay for it. Let me ask you just an honest question. Does that, does that mess with you? Do, do you, you get wires crossed and fried? Are your eyes crossed whenever you think about that? They did this to me and I'm just supposed to let it go like it didn't happen. But you got to understand, you're not supposed to let it go and excuse behavior. You let it go saying, I'm giving up the right to ensure that they pay. And you say, well, how can I do that? Here's how you do it. You get down on your knees and you look at Jesus and say, you didn't make me do anything in order for you to forgive me either. The right perspective is what did I do to deserve the grace of God? That's the right perspective. 
The right perspective is when you look at them and you say, you know what? I remind myself that I've already forgiven and I lay down at the feet of the cross and I remember that I needed forgiving once too. And Jesus said, I forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. As far as he was concerned, he forgave them in an instant. That's what God is asking us to do. Will they pay for it down the road? I don't know. It just seems it's a biblical thing that what people sow, they also reap. But it has nothing to do with your forgiveness on the front end. It has nothing to do with, with your healing. It, what does have to, have to do with you is canceling their need to pay in your heart. You don't have to excuse the action to forgive the person. Let me tell you something else forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not about what's fair. It's not about what's fair. For some of you, I get it. You don't deserve to be in the position you're in. It's not fair. Somebody else hurt you without cause. You, you, you find yourself having to heal from this and, and walk through life in this, and you simply did nothing to, to deserve it. It's not fair that you have to figure out how to forgive. Let me tell you, forgiveness is never fair, just like it wasn't fair for Jesus, but it was worth it to move him on to the next thing because it puts you in a position to be in right standing with God. That's why it's, that's why it's worth it. So don't wait for it to feel fair. Here's one we sometimes miss because of our principles. Forgiveness is not reconciliation. Forgiveness is not reconciliation. It might lead to a reconciliation with whoever it is that hurt you, but it's not reconciliation in and of itself. The person that you may need to forgive may not even be alive. It may be a parent or somebody that did something to you and now they've, they've gone on into eternity and now here you are left to deal with it. Forgiveness is, is not reconciliation or it may not even be possible to reconcile if they're still here on planet earth because, they're, because of what they've done and because of the lifestyle changes, there's, just, there's no way that you can reconcile. Forgiveness doesn't necessarily mean reconciliation. Forgiveness is something you do in your own heart that changes the way you live no matter where the other person is. Everyone in the crowd that was with Jesus that day didn't hear him say, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. He certainly didn't come off of the cross and restore relationship with every person there. He didn't do that. Forgiveness is your part, whether you reconcile or not. Let me tell you something that we, we don't often see with forgiveness. This is another part of forgiveness. Forgiveness is healing intentionally. Time is not going to heal you. I've seen so many people where bad things have happened to them and they're still just as angry and mad 10 years later as they are as if it had just happened. Time is not a healer. Time is an aid. It aids you the opportunity to go down the path of healing intentionally so that when that time frame has passed, you're a new person. But time by itself won't do it. If it did, we'd all be healed. Every single one of us wouldn't have an issue with forgiveness. We just have to wait it out. Time doesn't do that. Time is an aid. What you do during that time intentionally, that's what heals you. And I feel like this is one of the most undone processes when it comes to our hurts. Processes that intentionally put us in steps to heal. And here's why we don't do it. You ready for this really profound statement? Because it hurts. That's why we don't heal intentionally. Instead, we hide from it. We push it under the rug. We get around people that make us feel better. We get around things that make us feel better. Man, there ain't, when somebody hurts you, man, there ain't nothing better than to go get it on with somebody else that's not hurting you the way they did it. And we say, well, they're helping me heal. No, when the serotonin high of that wears off, you're just gonna project the unhealed hurt onto that person. Jesus wants you to walk with him, not move on. He wants you to walk with him, but healing demands, this is why we don't do it. Healing demands you spend time hurting. Healing demands that you focus on your hurt. Healing demands that you deal with yourself and look at yourself in the mirror and learn what, what could I have done different. Healing demands that you walk through why you're hurting. Healing demands that you learn to overcome the hurt that you have in your life. And if we're honest, it's easier just to move on and do things and be around people that bring us joy. And we don't even realize that that's not real joy. It's just covering it up. It's just sweeping it under the rug and time goes on and we think just because we don't feel bad anymore, we've healed. I don't feel the same that I used to. Well, the fact of the matter is you haven't healed at all. You just kind of got it out of your sight. 
but you see that person in Walmart and those emotions flood over you like it just happened. I knew a guy years ago, he's still a friend of mine. His name's Tim. Someone lied about him when he wasn't serving Jesus. He was involved in the wrong crowd. Somebody lied about him and got him locked up for three years. He was in jail for something he didn't do for three years. Took three years of his life away from him. And while he was in jail, he determined that when he got out, he was gonna take that guy's life. He was gonna kill him. And during the course of that three years, he got involved in a prison ministry. Some pastors would come to the prison and, and do services and talk to these guys. And he ended up giving his life to Jesus. And so he was like, Jesus this and Jesus that. God has saved my soul. And he moved on with life, but he never truly healed he never faced the hurt. He never dealt with what was deep inside of him. And after he got out of jail, he started coming to church. That's when I met him. He started coming to the church I was a worship pastor at. He got on the praise team. He started playing bass, great musician. And a lot of time passed. He ended up getting married. He had a little girl. His life was on track. And he was in Lowe's one day picking up a part for something he was working on in his house. And he saw that guy walk around the corner. And he said, Brian, before I even knew what I had done, I picked up a pipe and I was getting ready to hit him over the head with it. This is a guy who a lot of time had gone on and he thought he healed because he didn't feel the pain anymore. But here's the real litmus test of healing. When you think about the person that hurt you, when you see that person in public, when you think about the thing that happened and you've walked with God long enough, you've sat in the hurt and faced the pain long enough, you've dealt with it long enough to where now those same emotions don't flood over you anymore. When you think about that person, when you see that person, the, the thing that happened just becomes something and a part of your story that God's walking with you through. There may still be a scar there, and sometimes when, when we have scars on our bodies, they still hurt a little bit. Sometimes when we think about it, it's like, man, it, it just still kind of gets to us a little bit, but it doesn't have the same effect that it did. It doesn't become a thing that now controls the way you live your life and the way you make decisions. When you've healed from something, when you've, and the way you do it is you got to sit in the pain and, and walk with God long enough, not move on, sit in it. Let God show you what to do next. Let God bring you face to face with that hurt. And when you sit in it long enough and you get on the other side, those emotions don't control your life anymore. They don't make you pick up pipes involuntarily. They, they don't make you, your heart go into palpitations and your blood pressure skyrocket through the roof. They don't make you angry like they did anymore. It just becomes something that happened. It's a part of your story. But you're healed because you stayed in it long enough or you walked with God. Forgiveness I would say can't happen fully until you make a decision to heal intentionally. And that's not fair. But hurts will do that to you. But here's how, here's what I'll, how I want you to write it down. Facing the feeling is the beginning of healing. Facing the feeling is the beginning of healing. If you're going to forgive, then healing intentionally goes with it hand in hand. Do not Please hear me. Do not mistake the good feelings of moving on with healing. It's not healing. You're just moving on to something else that give you another dopamine hit. Healing can take place with God only because he's the only one that knows your heart. Do you know that God's hand is a hand of healing? When you hold his hand, it's, it's a hand of healing. And as long as you've got a hand holding onto your hurt, you can't hold on to the hand of God. You got to let go of it. You got to give it to him. Hold his hand. When you go to God with your hurt, to hold his hand and ask him, Lord, I need you to walk with me and heal you. Heal me. Do you know that God doesn't always take that hurt and toss it? But oftentimes God will take you and lead you right to the hurt and deal with it. He'll, he'll take you right to the hurt and bring you face to face with it. And sometimes it's the most painful thing. And we're like, I don't want God to walk me through this. <laughs> I want to go do something else. But when you hold on to God's hand and give him your hurt, he will often take you by the hand and sit you down and bring you face to face with the thing that hurt you. You know, about nine years ago, I went through a really bad divorce. And my particular story is one where another man was involved. It was a hard story. And just months after everything went down, uh, I was told that this other guy would be coming to a football game uh, of my son's. And 
My son was in middle school at the time, and it was the first time I was actually ever going to meet him. And I, I had decided, uh, based on principle, that I was not going to shake his hand. There's no way I could do it. And I, and I had been trying my best to get a footing in my life after what was like a nuclear bomb just completely obliterated anything I ever knew. The center of who I was, I was thinking things that I thought, man, I, I don't even know if I should be pastoring. Another week would go by and I'm like, I don't even know if I should be, if I'm a Christian, the things that I'm thinking, hurt will do that to you. The only thing I can say I did right, and believe me, this was it, is I threw myself before God and said, take everything I've got and help me because I won't make it if you don't. And in my principle, I decided I'm, I just can't shake his hand. If I'm gonna put my hand in his and shake it, when you shake hands with another man, it means you're agreeing on something. It means you're, you're saying that everything is okay. There's this, we're happy with the way things are. The issue's put to rest. And I just gotta be honest with you, the issue was not put to rest. There, there was nothing in me that, that felt satisfied or felt relieved, there was nothing. And I didn't want to be rude, I didn't wanna cause a scene, but I, I couldn't do it. And I decided in my principle, and by the way, you heard me say principle before, I, I didn't have the perspective of God, I had Ryan's principle. And I, I'm a, I, I speak a lot, and so I wordsmith the best two or three lines I could think to not be rude, not cause a scene, but to tell this guy, I'm not gonna shake your hand, and this is why, and then move on. And it was good too, man. I, I thought a long time about what I was gonna say, how I was gonna say it. I was like, man, this is perfect. This should be in a movie somewhere. And so I'm driving there, and I'm got that out of my head, and I'm starting to think about, okay, what am I gonna do? What's this gonna look like? Like, my emotions are absolutely going nuts. I don't know what my blood pressure was. And I, I remember getting about a fourth of a mile away from the school, and I was by myself. The kids were with their mom. They were on their way. And I got about a fourth of a mile away from the school, and God said to me, you're not gonna say any of that. And I know I waited till I was so close, so I don't have time to think about it. And I said, well, God, what am I gonna do then? And he told me, he said, you're gonna shake his hand just like you would anybody else. And I remember thinking, I don't know if I can do that, Lord. Why? But I knew he was saying it. I knew I was gonna do it because I knew he was saying it because Ryan Barbado didn't think that thought. God said it and I knew it. And so as I begin to take that kind of perspective on, I just begin to think about the Lord and think about how I would go about doing it. And, and what I didn't realize is my heart was beginning to soften because of it. And so I'm, I get there a little bit early, they start walking up and the kids are walking up with their mom and, and there he comes. And I'm gonna tell you, it's awfully hard to watch another man walk around with your family. But as I begin to look at him, I, I begin to see somebody who was broken. And God just allowed me to see this guy through his eyes. And I wasn't expecting that. I thought, well, gosh, I'll just shake his hand and be done with it. But God had more for me than that. He, he began to show me what he really was and how God began to see him. And I began to see him the same way and my heart began to break. And I thought about Jesus' words, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. You know that they knew they were hanging him on a cross. They knew they had beat him. They knew the decisions that they made. What they didn't know is the full extent of what Jesus had come to do. They, they didn't know the full extent of what they were doing in, in this narrative that God was writing. And in the same way, I, I, I began to realize as I watched this guy walk up that he knew what he did. He knew about the decisions he'd made, but there's no way he could fully understand what he did to a family. There's no way he could fully understand what he did to me and the kids. He didn't know. And I began to see him as a person that needed God to help him. I began to see him as a person that was broken and needed to see what God's grace looked like. I began to understand that broken people make broken choices. And the time came, he walked right up, stuck his hand out and I stuck mine out and I shook his hand and get this, it wasn't as bad as I thought. There are conversations that God wants you to have with people, but you're not having them because you're so scared. And it's probably not gonna be as bad as you think. There, there are things that God wanted me to do. That was just the first moment of a journey that was a lot of different steps like that, where 
I didn't realize it at the time, but he had me on a path of healing. Facing all that actually became the thing that healed me. And I remember another time specifically that I was supposed to go be around them. I think it was a, some kind of a, of a dinner or a meal. And I had told my children, I'm not going, I can't. During that time, I didn't know when I was gonna break apart emotionally in any given circumstance. I, I don't know if you've ever been through something so hard and so deep that you just didn't know whether you were gonna be able to make it emotionally or not. Just any moment, something was gonna happen that would remind or spring a thought and you just had no control. And I remember telling the Lord, I can't go, I can't do it. And God says, I'm desperately trying to get you to be a light for me. And how are you gonna do that if you keep avoiding the very people that I'm trying to put you in contact with? God not only wants you to heal, God wants to be a light through you. He wants to fill you back up with joy and peace, not just so that you have it, but so that there's an overflowing in you to everybody else, even maybe some of the people that hurt you. I took my hands off the wheel. I let God do the driving. It took everything in me to yield to God and not be offended that day. And it was only later I came across this verse in Proverbs 18, 19. It says, an offended person is more unyielding than a fortified city. <laughs> Talking about a city that's got walls so thick, nobody can get through it, it's impenetrable. And that's what an offended person is like. You're not gonna yield to nothing. An offended heart, you're not gonna yield to anything but hardness and callousness and towards that person that hurt you. And God was showing me that healing always involves facing it. It always involves being around it. It involves staying in it long enough to heal. And that was the first step. But did you know what God was showing me? It's the last thing I want you to know is that forgiveness is not impossible. And for some of you, you feel like there's no way I can get through it. There's no way I can do it. Let me tell you something, even for the hardest of hearts, or the heart that's been hurt the most, forgiveness is possible. You're standing there in the worst of your hurt and I hear God say to you today, there is life on the other side of this. And through him, through healing, through facing your fear, through understanding that it's not about reconciliation, it's not about what's fair, it's not about them paying, forgiveness is possible in Jesus Christ because of what he's done in your heart and God can help you see it, God can help you do it. For some of you here today, you're, you're wondering how you can be forgiven. Maybe it's not about somebody else forgiving, but you're trying to forgive yourself. You're, you're trying to figure out drastically, how could God forgive me for what I've done? I think it starts with this verse and then I'm gonna close. Colossians 2, 13 and 14, it says, then God made you alive with Christ. This is his word written thousands of years ago for he forgave our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. It was on that cross, he said, forgive him. Who do you need to forgive? Who do you need to take his word today and heal intentionally? Maybe that's the last part of the forgiveness journey in your life. Maybe you'd hear God tell you today, I forgive you. And maybe you need to accept that forgiveness. Let me pray for you. Father, as we get ready to close today, Lord, the service might be ending, but your word in our hearts isn't. And we're gonna walk out of here today, God, heeding to what you've said. Lord, I know it takes courage to be able to do that. And I know for a lot of people that have been hurt, God is gonna take more strength than they feel like they can muster. And that's why your word says that your strength is perfect. Let your strength be the thing, Father, that moves us forward when we don't have any strength left. God, for those in the room that they need your forgiveness, that they need you to forgive them, I wonder if you'd pray this prayer with me. God, I need you. And I'm sorry for my sin. I'm sorry for turning my back against you. I'm sorry for trying to do it my own way. I ask for your forgiveness in my life and I, I accept it. Your word says that you took it all. You paid for it. You canceled the sin debt against us by nailing it to the cross with Jesus Christ. And so I, I wanna live in that verse. I wanna accept your forgiveness today and walk out of here clean in the mighty name of Jesus. I believe that you really did die on the cross for me, for my sin. I could never be worthy enough. I believe that you really rose from the grave. And thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you so much for joining us today. We pray that something that was said in the service today resonated with you and is a blessing for you. And speaking of prayer, please take a moment to fill out the Connect card. If you have anything you need prayer over, we would love to pray with you. If you gave your life to Christ, we would love to be a resource for you. Again, thank you so much for joining us and have a great week.